This is an audio-only episode. Many people believe our next subject is a saint because she had amazing things happen to her. She experienced the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. She was able to visually live the Lord's passion. She had ecstasies in prayer and levitated. But this isn't what made her holy. And it's not what recommends her to us. Rather, it's because she did what all saints do, which is to do the ordinary things in extraordinary ways for the love of Jesus. And for this, she really is a saint who should be better known. Blessed Maria Giovanna Bonomo was born in Asiago, Italy, at her family's country estate on August 15, 1606, the first of four children born to Giovanni, a wealthy merchant, and Virginia Chesky di Santa Croce, who hailed from the nobility. Legend has it that she was somehow baptized in the womb due to fears her birth might not end well. And since it was the solemnity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, August 15, and it was assumed she would be a girl, that is how she was given the name Maria. In thanksgiving for her safe delivery, her father made a pilgrimage to the Holy House at Loreto. When Maria was just 10 months old, she received from heaven the power of speech and evidently obtained this ability to stop her father from committing some wicked act. And then at just five years old, by divine inspiration, she had already penetrated the mystery of the Eucharistic real presence. She also learned and spoke Latin well, even though she never had a lesson. As a child, Maria and her mother were frequently alone because her father was often away on business. In one instance, he was also away at jail. He had a quick temper and had stabbed a man. One day during his incarceration, his wife was told by their daughter, whom she had taught to pray from the earliest possible moment, Dear Mother, cheer up. Dad will be back soon. Virginia believed her daughter was relating some beautiful dream she had had, but Maria insisted, I have seen he has been released and he will soon be here with us. Dawn had not yet come upon the following day when Giovanni came knocking at the front door. Of her mother, Maria later said, she seemed more religious than secular. She dressed in black and divided her time between her household duty and exercises of piety. However, when Maria was just six in 1612, Virginia caught a malignant fever and died. Before she passed, however, she urged her husband to afford their daughter, quote, every convenience so she can consecrate herself to God. From the same country home into which Maria entered the world through her mother, the blessed now had a vision of her mother going out of this world into the blessing of heaven, enveloped in a beautiful cloud. Must have been an incredible grace. For the rest of her years in her father's home, Maria wasn't interested in fine clothes or such material vanities as other young girls of her age and station. Instead, every morning she went to the parish to hear mass. Each day she recited the office of the Blessed Virgin. And so we see this pattern that started in childhood and continued in her adult life of being very unusual. No matter the stage of her life, she did things people did not expect her to do. Keep in mind, she was just a small child at this point. Three years after Virginia's death, her father, unable to attend with due dignity to Maria's education, took her to the Poor Clare Monastery of Santa Chiara in Trent. The sisters provided her with a fitting education due her rank and according to the customs of the time. She learned religion, literature, music, embroidery works, and dancing. At night, she would go and kneel in front of the altar rail before the chapel sanctuary and the tabernacle therein, insensitive to the need for sleep or the cold. In this way, she discovered her vocation 
to the contemplative and penitent life. It was because of such factors that her confessor discerned she should receive her first Holy Communion. This was despite her being only nine, an age that was exceptionally young for the time for reception of the sacrament. On that occasion, Blessed Giovanni Maria later recalled, she felt like she was in heaven and she pronounced to her Our Lady a vow of virginity. At 12, Maria wrote to her father, stating her intention of becoming a poor Claire nun and staying in Trent, which is the hometown of Blessed Stefano Bellesini, who we featured in an earlier episode. At first, Giovanni hindered his daughter's vocation in every way possible. He came to pick her up on the pretext of making her know a little bit about the world. After all, this was a big step she was preparing to take at just 12 years old. At least she, you ought to know what you're missing out on, right? His real intent in making her return to Asiago was to get her started on the road to married life. He even suggested a coming out party. She refused this, however, because for the peace of her soul, she did not want to groom other than Christ Jesus. Finally, he consented to his daughter's desire. However, he reserved the right to choose the order in the monastery she would enter. For the time being, she returned to Trent to finish her schooling. In the town's church of Santa Chiara on Sundays, she accompanied mass with her violin playing, producing a sound so enticing that it attracted large crowds who stood outside the church walls to hear her play. Finally, at age 15, on June 21, 1621, Maria entered the Benedictine monastery of San Girolamo in Bassano del Grappa. Her father chose this place because his family had several relatives who were already here. Here she continued her path to perfection by following the three traditional ways, the purgative, the illuminative, and the sensory. She did this by intensifying her prayers, fasting, and flagellating herself with the discipline, which is a cord of knotted rope, and keeping long hours of silence. She was given the name of Maria Giovanna and went by the name of Sister Giovanna. And on September 8, 1622, she professed her vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. It was at this time that in a mystical vision, she saw Our Lady, St. Benedict, and various saints and angels. And around her neck, they placed three golden cords representing her three vows. Her life became studded with the most amazing apparitions, and for about seven years, she received many graces and was able to enjoy heavenly joy, especially in her frequent mystical experiences, which became ever more intense when receiving communion. She also had the gift of bilocation. With this privilege of experiencing the divine and dialoguing with the Savior, however, came a great testing and tribulation in body and in spirit. For starters, at age 20, during one of her usual ecstasies, Jesus put on her finger the ring of mystical marriage. For several years after that, every Thursday afternoon until Friday evening or Saturday morning, she relieved in her body all the moments and all the pains of her groom's passion. She also received the stigmata. The two were one. On the one hand, these phenomena filled her with joy, but on the other, they tormented her because they made her seem in the eyes of the others that which is not, as she put it. In her other words, they made her appear to be otherworldly. They made her the focus of attention when the attention should have been pointed to Christ. After all, she was just a creature. Without him, not only would she not have the phenomena, she would have nothing. So, so sisters prayed in, intensely until she was granted that the stigmata disappeared. Also from that point on, the ecstasies and the experience of the passion happened only at night. This allowed her to lead a normal life in the monastery by day. 
Not surprisingly, these phenomena caused her reputation for holiness to spread. To the door of the monastery, the visits of the curious and the needy overflowed. These masses came and went in a constant stream, all asking, almost arrogantly, to see the saint, the nun of miracles. At first, Sister Giovanna willingly went down to the visitor's parlor every time the abbess sent her there, and she would write letters to those who recommended themselves to her prayers, and she did what she was able to do to help the poor. Eventually, though, she began to feel uncomfortable about this strange situation. After all, it went against the very nature of being a cloistered nun. Moreover, her interactions with men became very frequent, and they bothered her greatly, leaving her very uncomfortable. Eventually, it was resolved to send her to a different convent, maybe a Capuchin one. But this aroused the opposition of some of the sisters, her confessor, and the diocesan curia, that is the chancery or the administration for the Diocese of Vicenza, which for seven years forbade her to go to the visiting room to receive any guests except for relatives. She had to stop her correspondence. The local bishop, Monsignor Luca Stella, was so concerned with what she said during her mystical ecstasies that he feared she would be brought before the Inquisition to be investigated for heresy. Blessed Giovanna's confessor, who knew nothing of theology or psychology, even considered her crazy. He didn't like the disruption she had inadvertently caused in the monastery. Truth be told, he didn't like her, period. And so he confirmed everyone's bad opinion of her. How? He made her go from cell to cell with a rope around her neck, had her knock at each door, and when the sister inside answered, say nothing. He had her kneel at the refectory or dining room door, asking a prayer of all the sisters who walked by. He told her to go through the monastery with an old basket on her head, jumping and saying, here's the crazy one. In order to humiliate her even more, he thought he was just keeping her humble. He imprudently ordered the nuns to go in procession to the cemetery and to make a circle around Sister Giovanna, who was made to lie on the ground at the side of an open grave with her fellow religious reciting in full the office of the dead. Furthermore, he went so far as to restrict her access to the confessional and forbid her even from receiving communion. She went some time without the Eucharist until one day an angel finally fed her the sacred particle. At the same time, she was afflicted by various illnesses, such as periodic fevers and sciatica. Eventually, not only could she not see visitors through the parlor's grate, she was forbidden from seeing her own family. They even forbade her from writing her father. The situation eventually changed for the better. Maria became novice mistress. She was allowed to resume her correspondence and was also elected abbess in June of 1652. During her time in office, she reformed the Abbey's spiritual practices, making them much more in line with the rule of St. Benedict, and she increased the sisters' charitable works. What is interesting about this is that she inherited a large debt. That kept the Abbey from making even necessary repairs to its crumbling infrastructure. But the more Sister Giovanna had the monastery give, the less it lacked for anything. Every morning, the enterprising abbess had her sisters recite five paternosters, that is, our fathers, for the perseverance of the just, the conversion of sinners, a good death for the dying, relief for the suffering, and the souls in purgatory. Every day, she prepared them for the matins of the following night, Matins is the part of the divine office that concludes just before dawn. And she did this by explaining the meaning of the Psalms they would recite and 
further by relating them to the passion of our Lord, with which she obviously had a lot of experience. Under her leadership, the monastery paid the debts, and she also expanded the physical plant with money received from her father. Her opposition amongst the sisters historically had come from a gang of four who really didn't like her. Now, with the monastery's expansion, these women complained to the Curia, claiming Sister Giovanna was squandering money. An investigation was launched. Investigators concluded that her management of the Abbey's finances was not only fine, it was beyond exemplary. On August 1, 1655, she was elected prioress, a post she held until 1664, when she was re-elected abbess. By her now new confessor's orders, it was at this time that she set down again her memoirs. Twice she had begun this project, but twice she had set it on fire. She taught the nuns that holiness does not consist in doing great things, but performing the ordinary and simple things in an extraordinary way. She gave the same advice to many outside the cloister, even the nobility who came from all over for her advice about their doubts, their worries, their material, and their spiritual needs. Not for nothing, therefore, was she called the nun of good advice. Additionally, many needy people enjoyed her great charity, a virtue that together with humility and her own patience were the characteristic of her life. But by now, she was old. Yes, full of wisdom, but also suffering from memory loss, racked with pain, walking with a cane, and these and other maladies finally forced her to bed. She prepared for her expected death by praying, meditating about the passion of the Lord, and kissing the wounds of the crucified one. She passed on March 1st, 1670. The center of her spirituality was the figure of Christ, the mystical spouse, contemplated in the most important phases of his earthly life, which we see from her writings, among which stands out meditations on the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as numerous remaining letters. So many miraculous healings were attributed to her intercession that in 1699, her beatification process was introduced and ended on June 9, 1783, when Pope Pius VI solemnly beatified her to the great joy of the population and around the Veneto region, and in particular of Bassano del Grappa and Asiago, which acclaimed her their patron. The last miracle attributed to her occurred in her home country during the First World War when, despite the furious bombardment that destroyed all of Asiago, the statue dedicated to her in 1908 and which stood in front of her birthplace inexplicably remained intact. Blessed Giovanna Maria Bonomo did extraordinary things and had extraordinary things happen to her. But this extraordinary life didn't just happen. Rather, it came about because she did the little things, the ordinary things, in an extraordinary way. How might we do things, the little things, the simple things, the ordinary things, in an extraordinary way for the love of Jesus, just like she did? I'd love to hear your thoughts below in the comments. Please do leave them for me. I will read them all. In any event, if you have liked what you have heard here today, please like, subscribe, and share. And consider joining us on Patreon so that we can continue this work. In the meantime, we'll see you next time on that Catholic Saints guy.